Hey everyone, and welcome to episode two of my technology vlog for stevenwagner.com. Uh, earlier this week, I released episode one. This is a completely off the cuff show where I've just got a few talking points and I kind of just roll with the flow. It's a new concept that I'm working with, uh, trying to see if it catches on. Kind of curious to see if people are wondering or curious about what I'm working on. Um, I share a few things just about what I've been working on during the week, fun stuff. Uh, issues, life updates, work updates, so and so and so. I think pretty soon here I'm going to also be kicking off a personal vlog, kind of getting into traveling and some other stuff that I do for fun, cars, AMGs, blah, blah, blah. But uh, I'm going to try to keep both the personal and the technology vlog separate, um, just so that one is targeted more towards my personal technology blog at stevenwagner.com and the other is just going to be kind of randomness of my life. So, and it'll be interesting to see who cares more about what. Uh, anyway, so today is May 14th, 2021. Uh, the last vlog, episode one, was on May 10th, 2021. Uh, a couple things that I've been working on this week. Uh, I received some new Tenzig Zero clients. I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, earlier, I think, I don't know if it was last week that I pulled the trigger or earlier this week, but I purchased um, a uh, 4610Q uh, Windows 10 IoT Thin Client along with uh, Tenzig's new beefy 4 K or sorry, no, 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 no. There's two fours here. Four times 4K displays. You got it right. Quad 4K displays on the Tenzig 6110 Windows 10 IoT IoT thin client. This thing is a tank, and I love it. I haven't had a chance to play with it too much, but the thing is, is that uh, uh, preliminary tests, it works great. I have a 3D accelerated VMware Horizon environment set up. Um, let's just say that I connected to it and uh, it was pretty, pretty nice. I've just got to find the time to drag out four displays. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to test the 4K capabilities, but this thing is such a tank that like, no questions asked, it can handle it. Uh, the uh, 4610Q on the other hand, that's a small little guy. Uh, it's an entry level device. It's kind of designed from uh, work from home users. Uh, this is just the typical device that you'd send out to your, uh, you know, accounting people that are working from home, uh, data workers, uh, so on, so on. Uh, anyways, I purchased those units to uh, to create some blog content. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm working on with the blog right now and video projects for YouTube. Um, the big hype right now for me with both work and for fun with the blog is VDI. And, you know, some of you might be getting sick of me talking about it nonstop, uh, but it's a hobby of mine. And right now, like I said in my last vlog, it almost seems like every company in the United States is implementing virtual desktop infrastructure. So I'm trying to keep up with the trend and I'm trying to create as much content as possible to uh, keep the consulting opportunities coming in. Uh, so with the content being created, uh, just a few things that I'm working on for fun, you know, uh, more instant clones in my VMware Horizon environment. Um, I mentioned that NVMe storage server project that I got running. So I've moved all of my instant clones and all of my VDI workstations onto the iSCSI target that's hosted on that NVMe storage. I've got a link in the blog, so check it out if you don't know what I'm talking about. But essentially, it's just an HPE ProLine ML310 uh, server that has four two terabyte Sabrent Rocket NVMe uh, drives inside of it, and it runs TrueNAS. And so I've got it configured to provide uh, an iSCSI target to my internal environment. The instant clones work slick. Like when you're pushing out these images, you take a snapshot and it redeploys them. It's just like bang, 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 done. Um, it's crazy and I love it. And it's doing exactly what I designed it for it to do. So, and there's no crashes, stability's perfect. So that's just something fun that I wanted to share with you. Um, now some other fun stuff that's coming up, HPE Discover 2021. Um, the uh, invite to HPE influencers dropped, uh, I think, on May 11th. So I'm all registered, ready to go, and I want you to join me. So inside of the link to this description, uh, actually somewhere up there, up there, I might have a logo, but um, the link is inside the description. It's a free event, so make sure you sign up. They're covering everything. And there's some pretty cool stuff this year. Like, uh, for example, HPE just released their HPE Electra storage system. Um, super, super cool stuff. I'm not going to get into too much of it right now, um, but think of it as uh, a storage architecture with the cloud in mind. I don't know. It's pretty cool. So Google, do some Googling on that. Check it out. Make sure you sign up for HPE Discover. Link is in the description. Uh, some other things that I've been working on. Here's something that's odd. So I have a firewall that has 163 day uptime. That bothers me. So, you know, traditionally, when you think of firewalls, you think of security devices. When you think of security devices, you think of security updates. 
Um, I was creating some firewall port exceptions the other day and I logged into my uh, Sophos UTM and uh, 163 day uptime. You know, it kind of makes you wonder in that amount of time, has there not been a security vulnerability that's required a new update to get pushed out? Or has it just been a really solid release? I don't know how I feel about that. You know, it could be a good thing, but it could be a bad thing. Like what's, is, is something getting missed? I'm not hinting that something's getting missed. I love Sophos. I'm a Sophos partner. My company sells Sophos products. It was just something interesting that I wanted to share that I thought was kind of cool. Um, another thing, this was a pain in my butt the other night. Exchange updates. So I've got an Exchange 2016 server running in my home lab. And as of earlier this week, it was running CU18, Cumulative Update 18. Um, now, as a lot of you remember, a month or two ago, there were some major exchange security vulnerabilities that were released. And these, ex these, these vulnerabilities were being exploited in the wild. Um, I actually noticed that um, one of the bots did a scan on my server. Thankfully, it left it alone. It wasn't able to authenticate. I spent something like 10 to 20 hours sifting through logs. I also assisted quite a few friends and uh, clients as well with uh, going through their exchange servers uh, log files and, and trying to find out what was going on with this. And mitigation was crazy too. Because as the situation was unfolding, the uh, the rules of mitigation were changing continuously. It was an evolving situation. And uh, for the most part, um, it got to a point where updates were released that took care of it. But, you know, at least that's what I thought. And so all of a sudden, I think it was earlier this week, the Exchange May security updates got dropped. Those updates were only for cumulative update, eight. Uh, sorry, 19 and 20 for exchange 2016 and i was running cu18 so you know i figured it was time to upgrade now this turned into a horrible horrible night for me just issues across the board so you know traditionally cumulative update um you just install it i use let's encrypt ssl certificates and so the thing is that i identified a bug where if you're using it and you go to do the upgrade with the cu uh, cumulative upgrade patch um, the upgrade will fail and then you'll have to do repair, et cetera, et cetera. So I was already prepared for that. I changed the SSL certificate back to a self-signed one, ran the CU, or I attempted to run the CU. I got stuck in an exchange reboot cycle. Every time I tried to run the exchange CU20 installer, it would tell me that there was a pending restart, either due to Windows updates that required a reboot or due to a pending um, ad features or roles installation. I did not install any features or rules that day or that week or that month from that matter. Anyways, doing a quick Google, you know, you find all these posts referencing these registry keys. And, you know, apparently if there's a failed upgrade or update, it leaves these keys inside of the registry on your server. So it thinks that there's a pending reboot. Now, when I checked the registry on my Exchange server, there were none of these keys. And I kept on searching and searching and searching and there wasn't. So I started to think, you know, like if it's complaining about a server role or feature installation, let's do something to disturb that part of the system. Like let's trigger it or like poke it or something like that. So what I decided to do was uh, I went inside of the server manager and uh, first I launched the CU20 installer and it told me about that. And w when you fail the prerequisites, it gives you an option to retry. So I was thinking that may or may not be a good idea. Tech like, should I close the installer and then try instigating or should I leave the installer open? So first, I uh, opened up the installer and uh, did that. It got to the point where I could retry, but it failed. And so I installed, uh, I think it was the TFTP client feature. So anyways, I did that. It did not require a restart. I hit retry and it failed. So uh, what I did is I rebooted the system, launched CU20 again, and uh, I went ahead and tried to um, uh, initiate the CU20 installer once again. And again, it failed, telling me that there was a pending reboot. This time I actually fully closed the CU20 installer. And I think the second time I installed the Telnet client feature. And surprise, surprise, as soon as the feature installed, I opened up CU20 installer and it installed, which was just freaking perfect. Uh, but now on the flip side of all this, and what made the night really interesting is that as I, as I was doing research into the, uh, the May patch for Exchange 2016, it turns out that the mitigations from the issues, I can't remember what the name of the vulnerability was called, but the mitigation from the previous months, I guess if you install a new cumulative update, you actually have to reapply the patch. And so after CU, so as soon as I read that, you know, technically, if you were to deploy a new cumulative update, the mitigations that you did prior 
are no longer in effect, which means that your server is going to be sitting there vulnerable on the internet. So thankfully, I read this because as the cumulative update was installing, I went ahead and uh, jumped into my firewall and I disabled the uh, port forwarding for 443 and uh, for 80 to my exchange server um, just to stop any bots that might be actively trying to um, exploit that vulnerability. So I let the cumulative update fail and, or sorry, install. It actually installed, no failing. Um, and then I went ahead and uh, installed KB, I think it's like 5001779. And uh, that takes care of the mitigation from a couple months ago. And then I could go ahead and do the May updates. And for what it's worth, that's, I, I don't even have the, the KB for that one. But yeah, so that wasn't fun. I did a blog post. I've got a link in the description, so check it out. But the moral of the story is that if you install any cumulative updates, make sure you install that mitigation that was from a couple months ago. I'm kind of surprised that it wasn't included in CU20. But again, I, I don't know what uh, what the release date was on that. Um, now, a couple other things, and I haven't mentioned this. Like, I posted a couple times on Twitter, but I, and I don't want to brag too much, but I'm kind of happy about this. Back in February, I actually achieved VMware vExpert status. And I'm pretty happy about that. So first of all, thank you to VMware and thank you for, I know that you ha they have to, uh, the experts have to be nominated or voted in uh, to do this, but uh, but I appreciate it. And uh, it's it's pretty cool. I, I've, you know, I'm kind of, I don't want to be too cocky, but it's kind of nice to be able to call myself a VMware V expert. Um, but I just wanted to share that with the viewers and the readers. Um, yeah, so, because I love VMware. I love VMware virtualization technologies. Um, it's running in my home lab. I love sharing. That's one of the reasons why I write the blog posts. Um, what else have I been working on? Here's a, and sorry about how scattered this vlog is. I'm just trying to cover stuff that I've been doing the last couple weeks or something like that. Uh, something I wanted to mention in last in episode one of my vlog was uh, I recently did a trip out to the middle of nowhere in Saskatchewan, right? That's up in Canada for the people in the United States that are watching this. Uh, Saskatchewan's the province next to Alberta. It's a lot of flat land. And uh, I have some family that recently moved there, so I went out to visit. Now, this is what's cool. So my brother, who moved there, um, he actually purchased the new uh, Starlink internet package. And like a lot of, you know, it's been hitting the news. Starlink's pretty cool. It's, it's like a satellite base. I think their satellites are in lower orbit. Um, so it actually provides a, a really fast internet connection to areas that don't have hardwired internet connections. And what's really cool about Starlink compared to traditional satellite is that I think it's because of the lower orbit that they maintain. Um, it's a lot less latency and it's a lot faster connections. And uh, I don't know what technologies they use to link up the satellites, if it's mesh based or whatever. But, but one thing that's cool is that my brother has Starlink. And so for this four or five day trip, um, I needed to do quite a bit of work. And uh, so I was thinking, hey, this is the perfect opportunity to try out VMware Horizon VDI on Starlink. And so when I got out there, I did a couple tests and like, you know, just from my system through Starlink to the internet, doing pings on Google, like I was achieving 35 millisecond latencies, 40 millisecond latencies and doing tests from his connection to my server back here up in uh, Calgary, Alberta in Canada. Um, you know, it was fluctuating between 50 to 80 millisecond latencies. That's not too bad. And one thing that was really interesting is that the entire time I was out there, I was connected to my VMware Horizon VDI environment and it was workable, you know, full three accelerated, dragging and dropping windows, um, using email, dragging and dropping files. It was a very usable solution. And I was actually really, really impressed. I even tweeted about it. Um, but it makes you start thinking, like, especially with my background, um, you know, like my IT services and managed services company um, for probably, you know, we're coming up on 15 years in July. Um, 60, 70 percent of my customers have been oil and gas companies. And so these are companies that have remote facilities in the middle of nowhere. And they were using satellite phones to communicate. They were using satellite internet. And the latencies were insane. You couldn't do much. But you know, you start taking a look at technology like uh, Starlink, and it all of a sudden opens up all these doors. Because the latency is so small that technically, if you were to get like a Starlink package and deploy it to a remote oil and gas facility, um, you could get voice over IP running, um, VDI sessions, um, file synchronization, 
um, you know, like some of these servers, you could, you'd have these caching mechanisms where like, you know, you load it up with 10, 15, 20 terabytes of, of data, like a storage array or something like that. Um, a SimpliVity node, right? Prep it up at the main office, ship it out, and then have it sync and do backups over the Starlink connection. Like the, uh, the possibilities are endless. It's, it's just really cool technology. And it was actually, it was just really cool to actually see it work real world and not talk hypothetical. You know what I mean? So... Uh, anyway, so some work updates. Um, so I just mentioned SimpliVity. So a couple weeks ago, I was uh, hired to do a big, big, big SimpliVity upgrade. Um, this customer had, uh, I think, three SimpliVity nodes that um, had been deployed for some time, and they hadn't been used or even updated for a very, very long time. Um, we had to do, I think, a three-step upgrade taking it to different versions of ESXi, taking vCenter to three different versions, as well as the uh, SimpliVity OmniStack controllers. Now, one of the reasons why I mentioned this in the vlog is because uh, we ran into quite a few issues. First and foremost, um, the ESXi and the vCenter package was so old that they were still using the Flash administration interface. So couldn't get in to, to do much, right? <laughs> like, and uh, so that was fun. And once we uh, got a workaround around that, it turns out that the identity store in the SimpliVity Federation or cluster or whatever you want to call it, um, it was out of sync. So the thing is that we were pulling absolutely no SimpliVity data into the vSphere plugins. Um, also, the SimpliVity side of, thing had, side of things had no communication whatsoever to the ESXi hosts. It was actually so bad that it was locking down the root accounts on the ESXi hosts. Anyways, so, you know, this is just a reminder, always, always, always maintain and keep your environments up to date. Um, and if you change your passwords, whether it's for the VCSA, vCenter server, or your ESXi hosts, and you're running HPE SimpliVity, make sure you log in and update the passwords on your uh, SimpliVity identity store because it's just going to save you so much trouble in the future. We ended up getting all that taken care of, but uh, one last issue that I wanted to mention about that big SimpliVity upgrade, and this kind of surprised me, is when we got to the final version, I think we took it all the way up to uh, SimpliVity 4.1.1.0, and one thing that was interesting is that the OmniStack controller update actually worked, but we had problems with the uh, SimpliVity Proliant support pack or uh, service pack. Um, we were for the most part, it worked, but when we upgraded, I, I can't remember what the NIC was. I think it was a Mellanox NIC or something like that. But when we updated the firmware, it could no longer de detect the connection. I think it's a 40 gig NIC, and that's what the uh, SimpliVity F Federation runs on. And so it would the OmniStack controller upgrade was successful, and then it would apply the, uh, the SimpliVity support pack or service pack. And then on the restart, the NIC was available, it was configured, and it appeared to be functioning, but it was showing that there was no link available for that NIC. And I tried all the, the, the standard troubleshooting, went in and I tried force, forcing 10 gig, they have it hooked up to a 10 gig switch. Tried forcing one gig, nothing would work. And so finally it got to the point, as much as I do not like to do this, um, I grabbed one of the older SimpliVity support packs, which we were actually running prior to the upgrade during the, uh, the multi-step upgrade pack upgrade and uh, downgraded the firmware on the NIC and surprise, it worked. So. I'll try to get the version numbers and, and toss it in the description. Um, we were so back but behind with that uh, SimpliVity upgrade with all the issues that we're running into that we just, I, I don't think we created a HPE support ticket to find out exactly why that was happening. But um, I think once we get caught up with some other projects, we might try to upgrade it to um, a new firmware, just not as new as the, uh, the one that was included in the um, SimpliVity support pack. Um, other than that, blog posts, uh, working on a couple, um, going to try to, uh, th there's a couple projects I'm working on those 10 zig zero uh, thin clients that I mentioned. I, uh, want to get a whole bunch of posts outlining posts and video outlining setup, configuration, usage. Um, really excited about the 6110. Um, and, uh, I am planning on creating a massive library of instant clone information and documentation for VMware Horizon. I'm going to be doing everything. I'm going to be creating blog posts and videos telling you how to create the perfect instant clone base image. 
I'm going to be talking about deploying Office 365 and Microsoft 365. Um, I've already got some new blog posts on Teams and uh, Microsoft Teams optimization for VDI and Zoom for VDI optimization. Um, I'm going to be doing other stuff too, so stay stay tuned for those blog posts. Um, some of them are really, really orchestrated, so it does take me quite a bit of time to actually generate the content, write the content, and uh, do the videos. The, the video editing takes up the most amount of time. Uh, so again, I think that pretty much sums it up for the week. It's May 14th, Friday. I think I might actually try to take some time off this weekend for myself, maybe do a little bit of work, depending on if I get some emails back from some people that I've been waiting for a response from. Uh, but again, don't forget to uh, register for HPE Discover. It's free and there's no reason not to. You can pick up, the, there's so many workshops where you can learn. Like last year, I attended a whole bunch on SimpliVity, Synergy. Um, you can get hands-on with the products remotely. Like it's it's really cool. They really go above and beyond. So make sure you register for that. Again, vlog two, signing off. Feel free to, uh, don't forget to like this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and leave me feedback. Tell me if I'm talking too fast, too slow, if there's too much garbage, or if there's more that you'd like to hear about. Um, I appreciate all the feedback. So have a great day, and I hope you enjoyed the vlog.